for a few of you who don't know me, I'm Pat Johnstone. I'm a community organizer here in Marin County, wearing many hats, uh, one of which is to be co-coordinator of the Move to Mend affiliate, along with Craig Slater, who's in the back. Hey, Craig. Um, and I'm really thrilled that uh, you get to experience uh, this presentation by David, David Cobb. Um, I am also um, work with Move On, I'm a regional organizer, and the very first act I did when I uh, came into leadership with Move On was to hold a, um, a, a rally on the anniversary of Citizens United, a Move to Amend um, rally. And the reason I did that was because Move to Amend really resonates with me as the language and what we need to do. It's not just Citizens United, it's not just money out of politics. We have corporations really gaining power in our lives and we need to figure out a way to, to stop that. And David, um, who is an attorney, who is an engaged citizen, who ran for president on the Green Party, um, is going to tell you more about what we do and why you get involved. And when David finishes with you and gets you all riled up, I'm gonna come back in and make sure you've all signed the petition and grab some buttons and bumper stickers and come out and work with us. So here we, here's David Cobb. All right, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, folks. So my grandfather was a Baptist preacher. And my voice tends to project. So I'm going to try. And my preference would be to just talk to y'all without the need of a microphone. But I want to make sure. So, But in the very back, can I? All right, good. So that, what that means is we're not going to need this. Uh, you know, as Pat said, my name is David Cobb. I am a lawyer. I've sued corporate polluters. I've lobbied elected officials. I have run for office myself. I ran for Attorney General of Texas in 2002, pledging to use that office to revoke the charters of corporations that routinely violate health, safety, you should turn that off, health, safety, and environmental protection laws across this country, uh, and especially across the state. I ran for president in 2004, and I'm most proud during that effort, actually, that I was arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience because I actually thought that the American people ought to deserve to hear from a candidate who was actually against the war, for single payer, wanting to end the illegal, immoral, and unconstitutional wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And see, the thing is, it's not the first time I've been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience. In fact, when I run for office, I say I run on my arrest record. <laughs> I've been to jail for justice, and I'll tell you something else. I reckon I'll go back before we win. And here's the good news, sir. We're going to win. I, so. I genuinely believe that we're going to win, but uh, what I know about it is this, that what I'm going to need to do is to persuade you that we can win. I don't need to persuade anybody in this room or anybody watching me right now. I don't need to persuade you that things are bad. We all know things are bad. I think my job is to persuade you that there's a plan that is both systemic enough, concrete enough, that could actually transform the society that we live in. And so, since I want to be persuasive, I want to share with you something that I learned intuitively as a successful trial lawyer. That's this. If you want to be persuasive, facts don't matter so much. <laughs> Y'all, the first time I heard that, I thought, this is terrible. Right? Like many of you, I've invested a lot of time and energy into facts. And you sort of think that if you just learn to present facts logically and cogently, everybody will see what we see and the world will just change. But then I came across the work of a fellow named George Lakoff. Oh, you know George Lakoff. He deserves a round of applause. George Lakoff, a cognitive scientist who proved that through the study of the human brain and our structure and how we process information, the human brain is not a supercomputer just running algorithms. We don't make sense of the world through the logical application of facts. We make sense of the world through the stories we tell each other. And the stories that are told over and over again become the cultural narrative or the frame. It becomes the reality that we perceive. And so what Lakoff says, if you want to present new facts to somebody, you damn well better present them in light of their pre-existing story, their narrative, that frame. And so since I want to be persuasive, and because I know that human beings understand the world through stories, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that these large transnational corporations are not just exercising power today. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that large transnational corporations are ruling us. 
as surely as masters once ruled slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling over us because they're making the decisions. Corporate CEOs already decided what your transportation choices were going to be to get to this meeting. Corporate CEOs are deciding what kind of health care you'll get. Doesn't matter what you need, corporate insurance CEOs decide whether you get it or not. Corporate CEOs are conduct controlling the energy policy of this country. Corporate CEOs are determining how much poison will be in the water that we're drinking and the air that we're breathing. Corporate CEOs decided to take this country into war. And we, the people, we get to choose between Coke or Pepsi. We can choose between paper or plastic at a grocery store line. See, we're given all sorts of consumer choices, provided you have the money to pay. That's sort of important because in our society, if you don't have the money to buy it, it doesn't matter what your needs are. But even deeper than that, I'm going to challenge you to recognize this, that no matter how wonderful a consumer choice is, it is not political power. See, political power would be the opportunity to participate in a meaningful way with the decisions that affect our lives. You know, things like the XL pipeline that is actually going to clearly impact our lives. The question about whether Social Security will be slashed. You know, the kinds of things that really matter to us on the day to day. I submit this to you. We have very few opportunities for meaningful participation to actually influence those things, right? And so consumer choices are fine, but let's just be very clear. It's not the same thing as robust political power, which is why I'm so proud that we're being sponsored by Democracy for America and Progressive Democrats of America and Move On and a local Move to Amend local affiliate all coordinating, coming together, because those are the groups that are actually creating mechanisms by which we can exercise power. We don't have formal opportunities other than voting once every two to four years. Now, I want to be clear. I vote. Right? I've run for office, I vote, I believe in voting, but if, all, if you want systemic change and all you ever do is go and pull a lever every two to four years, you're wasting your time. Right? If you want systemic change, we've got to vote and get involved in organizations that are actually helping to collectivize power and to actually make demands. Right? So I'm going to tell a story today, and as I tell this story, I want to challenge you to challenge me to make sure and ask yourself, is this a story that only political progressives can hear and understand? Or has Move to Amend figured out a way to tell a story that will cut across <coughs> political ideologies, cut across party affiliations and labels, and actually unite us around a shared analysis of how our democratic republic is supposed to operate? And as I tell this story, we're going to cover four topics together. The first topic is the word democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot in the United States, so let's sure, make sure we've got some common ground. From what language does the word democracy derive? Greek. Greek, very good. Demos means? The people. Kratia means? Anybody know? Rule. Literally, translated from the Attic Greek, the word democracy means the people rule. Pop quiz. How many of y'all believe we the people are ruling in the United States? <laughs> Don't be shy. Look around. We got one hand in the air. I do this presentation all across the country. I did it 150 times last year. We're going to do it more than 150 times in 2013. I ask this question everywhere I go. Almost nobody raises their hands. That's a problem. Saying it another th way, I would say it's a good thing. What? No, no. It's not a good thing that the people don't rule. I think it's a good thing that people aren't raising their hands to that question. I think it's a good thing that we're being courageous enough to confront a scary reality that notwithstanding what we were taught in this country, notwithstanding what we want in this country, we the people don't actually rule. We don't actually have a functioning democracy in the United States of America. In fact, if we were to stay with the Attic Greek, we'd have to admit we don't have a democracy. We have a plutocracy, the rule by a small wealthy elite. In fact. If we were really going to be honest, we'd have to make up another word, a kleptocracy, the rule by a thieving small wealthy elite. And that brings me our corporatocracy. I might use that next time, sir. I'll give you credit this time because everybody heard it in front of me, but next time they'll think I was clever. Uh, 
That brings me to the next word, which is the word sovereignty. Friends, if I just had the word the sovereign on the board, who or what would you think of? Quick, the sovereign. King. king I bet all everybody here thought the king. That's because the word sovereignty means the authority to rule. And 500 years ago, the sovereign was the king. The king was the sovereign. Those words were literally synonymous. And where, by the way, did the king claim his sovereignty or authority to rule? God, you don't get more legitimate. I mean, that's a big deal. To illustrate what I mean by this, I'm going to do a quick little exercise with y'all. This exercise is always a lot of fun for me. You'll see, I will invite those assembled at this community meeting room to close your eyes, if you're willing, and to repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. I told y'all this was fun for me. Oh, a couple of you did it, so let's try another one then. Because David is God's representative on earth. <laughs> oh, this is going well. I'll try one more. And therefore, anything David says must be obeyed without question. <laughs> He's the first one that learned how to read. So now is the time I would normally say open your eyes. But to your credit, Moran, nobody's eyes are closed. <laughs> Good on you. I will say this, though, that y'all did what everybody does. As soon as you realized what I was asking you to say, you all laughed at me. Did you notice? There was sort of chuckling and, uh, you know, around it. And you know why you laughed? Well, because it's funny. And not funny as in, oh, what a witty and droll comment David has made. It wasn't that sophisticated. It was absurd humor, right? You laughed because I said something ridiculous, so you laughed about it. I mean, the idea that I can tell you how to live your life because who my daddy is? Even better that I get to tell all of you how to live. I get to say how society itself is going to be organized and operating because of the divine right of kings. Of course you laugh at that. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. And 500 years ago, people just like you and you and you and you and me not only said it, but we believed it. Friends, I'm asking you to take a moment to really reflect. The question of sovereignty, not just who has the authority to rule, but what is the legitimate protocol and process for making decisions for society? This might be one of the most important questions that any group of human beings ask for themselves. And as Pat said in her introductory remarks, I'm a Green Party member and I'm proud of that. And I'm equally proud to say I frequently work in coalition with Democrats. When I find common ground on an issue, I will work in solidarity in coalition with Democrats. I'll go you one better. When I find common ground, I'll work with libertarians and republicans too. And the reality is, during the fights against the National Defense Authorization Act and the Patriot Act and other assaults on civil liberties, frequently libertarians and republicans were my coalition partners. I'll work in coalition with socialists and anarchists. See, I'll work in coalition with anybody if I can find authentic agreement, enough authentic agreement to work in commonality. And I'll say that not so you pat me on the head. I say it so you'll appreciate what I mean when I say in my 20 years of social change work looking for coalition partners, I've never had the privilege or the opportunity to work in coalition with a monarchist. <laughs> I can't find one to work with. Right? And 500 years ago, that's all there were. And 500 years is the blink of an eye in human history. So when people tell us, oh, you can't amend the Constitution, it moved to amend, that's too hard. We can't do that. I think, have you not been paying attention? Throughout all of world history, throughout all of US history, profound changes have been made. And I don't just mean changes in one administration or another. I don't even mean one political party or another. I mean, changes in social institutions, changes in power dynamics, changes in our culture and how our society is organized have been made. And now, my friends, the Texan gonna get metaphysical on y'all, so get ready. I've, I've noticed that it sometimes, like, it bothers some Californians when a Texan is metaphysical, so I wanted to warn you up right up front. <laughs> We are all individually participating in creating our shared collective reality. Another way to say it is, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it will, be it will become true. 
And so here's the thing, folks. If it is true that the United States of America is fundamentally racist, sexist, and class oppressive, and that is true. And if it is true that the huge transnational corporations are destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself, and that is true, then I suggest to you that we ought to be thinking and acting differently. Maybe we ought to start thinking and acting like we're in a crisis. You know why I think we ought to start thinking and acting like we're in a crisis? Because we're in a crisis. I mean, literally, we're in a crisis right now, and most of you know it. And here is the thing. We know we're in this crisis, but the ruling elite and the people who are really in charge of this society constantly suppress that knowledge and, even worse, work to convince us not to articulate out loud what we know to be true. We know we're in a crisis. In fact, let's name it. It's an ecological crisis that's happening across the globe. It's an economic crisis. It's a social justice crisis. In fact, it's a series of crises that are cascading down around our ears. And I say that because I think it's important to tell the truth so we can have some clarity about what's really going on so that we can make smart, intelligent decisions about what to do as engaged citizens. The other thing I want to say is don't get too upset because remember that in the Chinese language where they use symbols for words, the symbol for the word crisis is also the symbol for another word. Opportunity. Opportunity. Folks, we are in a crisis moment that is both opportunity, danger at the same time. And let's just tell the truth that this crisis is a crisis of the implosion of an empire. And as I say that, let's just acknowledge something that we know from world history, all empires fall. That's a truism. And what's interesting as we study world history, we see every empire has fallen because of imperial overshoot. That is that the empire goes out, sucks up the natural resources from the surrounding area so badly, so profusely that it implodes. And in past times in human history, the survivors of that empire would simply meld into the savanna or the forest or the jungle or whatever the ecology was around them, right? What we have to come to terms with, for the first time in human civilization, this is a global empire. There's no place to go. So I submit to you that our challenge, our duty, our responsibility in this generation is to learn to intelligently, intentionally, deliberately dismantle empire and dismantle the institutions that are fundamentally unsustainable and are exploitive and oppressive and create new institutions that are sustainable and that are premised upon and facilitate love and compassion and sharing. And you know what? We know those are actually core human values, love, compassion, and sharing. Why don't we hear that talked about in elections or amongst politicians? When's the last time we heard somebody really willing to stand up and say, we need to be a more loving and compassionate society, and we need to have policies that help to facilitate the best instincts uh, of human beings, right? And this idea of dismantling empire and recreating institutions, it really is just that simple and just that hard. But that's the challenge for us. And that'll bring me to the next topic, which is legal personhood. My friends, please note that I did not write the word corporate personhood on the board. That's because legal personhood means the ability to assert rights. And since I'm talking about legal personhood, I mean the ability to assert rights under law. And saying it that way, I hope it's obvious that this is not a technicality. This is not something that only lawyers should concern themselves with. The question of who is a legal person and who can assert rights under law has been at the core of every social movement in this country. From the American Revolution itself, to the women's suffrage movement, to the abolitionist movement, to the civil rights movement, the question of who is a legal person matters, and it matters a great deal. And the last topic on the board is the word corporation. From what language does the word corporation derive? Latin, very good. Let's break it down. Corpus means body. And the suffix T-I-O-N means to have or create, or the inherent quality of. So literally, the word corporation translated means to have or create body. And by body, in this case, I mean physical body. 
That's because in law school we are taught. By the way, are there any lawyers in the crowd besides me that would admit it? All right, here we got two right here that would raise their hand. So uh, two men, I think. So my brother's at the bar. Do you remember being taught this in law school, that a corporation is a legal fiction? Of yep. course, right? Every lawyer I ask knows that. Watch this. Even if you weren't subjected to three years of the law school experience, if you've heard that phrase, even if you couldn't precisely define it, if you've heard that a corporation is a legal fiction, raise your hand, for real. Look, half of the hands, more than half the hands go up. Corporation is legal fiction. Corporation is a legal fiction. A corporation is a legal fiction. So if a corporation is a legal fiction, that begs the question, what does the word fiction mean? <laughs> Not true, made up, literally. In law school, my corporations professor on day one stood before us and said, you must understand that a corporation does not exist in the material physical world. You know, reality, <laughs> it doesn't actually exist, the professor told us, but we will pretend like this group of people and the material and resources that they have assembled and the contractual obligations that they make and the cultural assumptions, a very rich, complex abstraction, we're going to pretend like it's a physical one thing under law so that we can treat it a certain way under law. And remember, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it becomes true. It becomes true. A corporation is an abstraction, but it is constructed because we socially give it meaning and reality, and then the legal system and our social institutions act accordingly. This is a super big idea. And the Romans were the first people to create this genius idea of a corporation, and it really is creative and a genius idea in order to do things. For example, how many folks here in this crowd have either heard or better yet, have literally said the words, all roads lead to Rome. It's 2,000 years later, everybody still says that, right? Well, check it out. That amazing road system was built and designed as a corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula without electricity, a quick parenthetical, one of the reasons that I continue to have such optimism, genuine hope for change is my knowledge of how smart and clever and creative human beings are. In fact, I submit this to you. I don't think you could name a problem that I can't give you the solution to if you give me about 30 minutes and access to the internet. Because <laughs> I'm not saying I got the solution. I'm saying if you give me the access to the internet in about 30 minutes, I'll find somebody who solved it. Actually, what I'll find is a group of human beings working cooperatively and collectively who together have solved the problem because what we know about human beings as the primates that we are, we really do amazing works whenever we are cooperating together, right? Another way to say it is every problem that exists today, there is a solution to it that clever, creative people have figured out. The problem is that those solutions are not implemented because we don't actually control the government and the institutions that could make those solutions uh, happen. Another way to say it is we just got to come to terms with this reality. Every problem that we're facing today is at its core a political problem because the solutions exist and they're not being implemented. But that aqueduct system that I described, guess what? It was conceived, designed, built, and operated as a corporation. In fact, the first universities, the first hospitals, can you guess? Corporation, corporation. So here's a pop quiz question. What is a road system, a water system, a university, a hospital? What do they all serve? The public. Everything I just said is a public service. In its original orientation and creation, the genesis of the corporation was to create mechanisms under law to allow private money to be assembled and put to public use. But unlike taxes that are mandatory, the genius of the idea of the corporation was to do it in a voluntary basis. Folks, I hope you understand the move to amend coalition is not anti-corporation. That would be foolish. There are very many important good uses of corporations. It's really a very important way to help to assemble like resources and allocations, right? A corporation is a tool and nothing more. And in fact, sir, what's your first name? Leon. Leon. 
Leon, I want you to imagine that before you stands David Cobb, and now I'm a skilled carpenter, and I have in my hand a hammer, and I'm going to build a house for you, and I do good work, and I charge you a fair wage for a good day's work, and I'm building a house that you want. Right? And you can look and see that's, a, that's good workmanship that's happening right before your very eyes. Is that hammer good or bad? Well, it's good, right? Here I am building the house that Leon wants. Now, Leon, I want you to imagine the same scenario. David Cobb stands before you, hammer in hand. Only this time, I'm coming to bash your skull. Is the hammer good or bad? It's a trick question. <laughs> the hammer is neither good nor bad. It's a tool. In the first scenario, the tool is being put to appropriate productive use. You have good David Cobb, productive David Cobb. In the second scenario, the hammer isn't bad, but what you do have is bad David Cobb. Apparently homicidal David Cobb. <laughs> but the point is this, the hammer is neither good nor bad. A tool is neither good nor bad. The question always should be, to what end are we putting tools? And in the case of the corporation, we have to acknowledge that these huge transnational corporations are not just be putting to horrible use, but the legal system, political system, and economic systems are incentivizing and not only allowing it, but in many responses are literally requiring destructive actions on the part of these incredible, powerful, profound tools. And that really forces me to underscore that we recognize that this is not exactly how the modern transnational corporation is operating, is it? That's because the modern transnational corporation actually comes out of the 14th and 15th century of Europe. You know the age of discovery? I have to put discovery in my imaginary quotation marks because after all, what did the Europeans discover in the 14th and 15th century? Well, Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash, right. <laughs> there were people living there. They were not lost. They weren't discovered. And so in the same spirit of truth-telling and courageous honesty that we exhibited earlier, let's just tell the truth. The 14th and 15th century wasn't the age of discovery at all. It was the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. There's one word that sums that up for me, and that's empire. See, that's what imperialism means. And this is important, stay with me, because the modern transnational corporation, as we would understand it, was actually created during the era of the modern European empire, and it was done intentionally and deliberately. The point is, the, they were called joint stock companies, and the joint stock companies were created as a construct as intentional, deliberate, imperial tools. For example, one of the most famous of those joint stock companies was the East India Company. Ah, you've heard of it. Literally designed to militarily conquer the entire subcontinent of India. But not only that, to destroy their civilization and to force those people to work and labor to steal the resources from their own land so that those resources could be sent as wealth to the shareholders of the East India Company as profit. It was a business model based on imperialism. Another one of those joint stock companies was the Africa Trading Company. Anybody want to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? Slaves. Folks, I'm going to use myself as an example because I don't think that white people have honest conversation about uh, race and certainly not about whiteness in this country often enough. And I'm using myself as an example because I'm going to tell you something that I'm not particularly proud of. I mean, I'm not ashamed of it because I'm just a product of this society. So what I'm not proud of is this. If somebody were to ask, what did the Africa Trading Company trade, and I was just being casual and not really thinking and deconstructing how racism and sexism and, uh, and uh, oppressions actually operate on the day-to-day -day in this society, if I was just being casual, the word that would pop into my head, slaves, of course it would. I've been taught as a little child about the transatlantic slave trade. I've been taught about how wonderful it was that Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth were runaway slaves and helped other slaves run away. But now that I've made such a big deal about the word slave, I'm going to ask this question. In the 14th and 15th century, when the Africa Trading Company was in action, was Africa populated by slaves? <laughs> no. no, Africa was populated by people. Africa was populated by people. And now I'm going to tell you with some 
trepidation but with conviction, Africa was populated by people who were basically just like me. Now I say it with trepidation because I know what skin color I have, I know my pigment, I'm not foolish, but I say it with conviction because if you ask any human, if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, they will tell you race does not exist. It's such a trivial distinction at the genetic level that no scientist or biologist who would say, yes, pigment exists, and so does hair, well, for those of you who have hair, let's say eye color exists, and you know, there are, there are physical differences, right, that can be sort of grouped around things, but no scientist would ever elevate those trivial genetic distinctions to a classification or a taxonomy under science. So race does not exist, but check this out. Racism damn sure does. Well, how can that be? Oh, yes. If enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it becomes true. It becomes true. Race is a construct that was created as surely as the corporation was a construct that was created, and race was created for a reason, and that reason was to justify the depraved, ju unjustifiable idea of enslaving human beings, right? And the reason I'm talking about this is to underscore and lift up this reality. Racism, militarism, corporatism, imperialism, they are all inextricably linked. And what links them? Exploitation and oppression. Martin Luther King Jr. said that in his most famous speech. No, his best speech. His most famous speech is I Have a Dream. His best political speech is the Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam that he delivered at the Riverside Church. And in that speech, King actually lifted up and said, the intersections of exploitation is actually what is preventing us from becoming the country that we deserve. And I think that he's right. And what is linking them? Exploitation and oppression. And again, I believe that if we're going to create this loving, compassionate world that we want, that we know is possible, we're going to have to learn to force ourselves to identify confront, name, challenge, and dismantle any kind of exploitive, oppressive institutions and systems and replace them with ones based on love, compassion, and sustainability. It's just that simple and just that hard. And since I'm just telling a story, remember this is a story, right? I'm going to make it an American story by asking this question. How many colonies in the founding of the United States of America? 13. Well, everybody knows that. How many colonies in the founding of the United States? 13. 13. So since you all knew that and it was so easy, I'm going to ask the follow-up question. Of those 13 colonies, how many of them were corporations? All of them. Doggone it. That was supposed to be a trick question. But this is, a, this is a very politically astute crowd. The answer, all of them. And the, the, because it took the king to create or give body to each one of them. And the king created each one of them by the use of a very particular legal instrument. Anybody know the name of the legal instrument the king used to create Massachusetts? Charter. A charter, very good. To illustrate how the king uses a charter to create Massachusetts, we'll do another exercise. In this exercise, I'll be the king. Why do y'all think I get to be the king in this exercise? Because I'm talking. <laughs> another way to say it, because I'm telling the story. See how important stories are? See how important it is that we should spend a little time asking who's telling these stories. Because I'll tell you something, friends. What I've actually figured out is the stories in this society really are not being told on either Fox News or CNBC. The real stories are actually being told in 30, usually in 30-second and 60-second little advertising implements. And really, the story that's told over and over again is in order to have what we want, what we really want, which is connection, meaningful, productive work for which we'll be appreciated and acknowledged, connection, you know, the things that humans really want, we're told the only way we can get it is to buy a bunch of crap. And what's really, really sad and tragic about that is those things never actually make us complete. We become like the proverbial hungry ghost where we just keep consuming, consuming, and we never actually find the things that will make us happy and joyous. And what's tragic about that, not just that we will never actually be happy 
is that we're destroying the planet in the process of consumption, mindless materialism and consumerism, right? And so stories matter, and really the stories are deeper. There are cultural stories. It's what the Pachamama Alliance has actually been challenging us and encouraging us to think about is what are the stories of our culture? And what's amazing is if you actually talk to any human being in this society about what they want and what kind of life they'd like to have, it's almost never about stuff. It's always about human relationships. That's what we really want. And so if we can find ways to intentionally, deliberately lift up the stories that we really want, we'll start to change the narrative, right? We'll start to change the story around just mindless consumption that, by the way, won't make us happy, but will also destroy the planet, and we can start to transition away. It's just that simple and just that hard. Now, I want to get back to this story, though, because in this story, I'm going to be the king and I'm going to create Massachusetts. But listen, folks, I'm not going to bother with administering Massachusetts on the day-to-day. -day. I'm the king. I've got other people to exploit. So instead, I'm going to create an office known as the royal governor. And now, friends, I'm going to actually quote from the original charter that created Massachusetts. I, the king, create Massachusetts. Create a legal position and title known as the royal governor and then task the royal governor with the legal responsibility, quote, and this is an actual quote, quote, to plant, to rule, and to govern this new area on behalf of me, the king, to benefit me, the king, but also to benefit the other shareholders of the joint stock company known as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. See, Massachusetts began as a for-profit corporation on the same business model as the East India Company. So too, Virginia began as the Virginia Company. Georgia was a penal corporation. Guess what skin color the original slaves had, basically, who worked Georgia? White. white. Let me tell you something, folks. When I said that white people don't, have, don't talk about uh, race and whiteness enough, it's really important that we come to understand that whiteness as a concept was created as a construct to bamboozle people who look like me. And by that, I want to say this. Thanks to my mama, I'm sorry, this is California, my grandmother, <laughs> thanks to my grandmother, I know that I descend from Scots and Irish. And two peoples, by the way, utterly and completely exploited and oppressed by the British Empire. And there's a special place in hell for the British Empire as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> But I'm going to ask this question. How many of you know with some degree of certainty that you de descend from Irish heritage? Right? Always happens, right? A lot of hands go up. Guess what? Congratulations, you're recently white. <laughs> How many people knew that the Irish are only, in, in human terms, recently white? A couple other hands go up. There's a great book called How the Irish Became White. And it is a profoundly important book for white people to understand that whiteness was a construct created to bamboozle white people to prevent us from seeing our commonality so that we can have coalition. And it goes basically like this. If you look like me and you're poor or working class, it's very clear that you understand the boss man's boot is on my neck. It's a constant thing. I hate this system. It's exploited. It's oppressive. This is horrible. It sucks. I hate it. Hey, at least I'm white. This whole notion of whiteness is something that we need to start de deconstructing because again, whiteness, imperialism, corporatism, these are inextricably linked. It's about exploitation and oppression. And when we're willing to confront that, we realize, hey, most of the stories in our culture are actually sort of suicidal because they're based on exploitation and oppression. If we actually started to tell different stories, we'd start to create a different reality for ourselves. Another way to think about this, my friends, is that in cont contemporary terms, we would not call the person administering uh, this corporation a royal governor. What would we call that person? A CEO. My friends, the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. The American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible CEO. Perhaps today we could raise our aspirations a little higher. Maybe we should remember that our historic legacy, we come from revolutionaries. 
That's actually what the American Revolution was, right? I mean, it's a very important and profound way to think about it. And I'm going to go further. The American Revolution was not merely a rejection of monarchy as a form of rule. Now that we understand this theory, this history, can't we see the American Revolution was also a people's uprising against illegitimate corporate rule? That's our historic legacy. And although I said the American revolutionaries were not more calling for a more socially responsible king, I think it's super important to recognize that just 10 years before the revolution actually erupted, those people who would become revolutionaries, just 10 years before, most of them were writing letters to the king that went something like this. Oh, Father King, we, your humble and obedient children, come before you on bended knee to beg that you intervene on our behalf because your royal governor is administering unfair rules. Unfair business and trade rules, by the way. It wasn't just taxation without representation. The complaints were against the Stamp Act, the Navigation Act, the Intolerable, Intolerable Acts. All international trade and business rules. They said, King, the English Parliament are passing unfair, unjust, illegitimate rules that are favoring the East India Company Joint Stock Company Corporation over us. And we're subjects, we're human English subjects. Up to you, pop quiz. What percentage of the English Parliament passing these laws do you think owned shares in the East India Company? A hundred percent. See how important it is that we actually ask these kinds of questions? And they begged, Father King, would you please intervene on our behalf? It was the most sniveling, groveling language you can imagine. And I don't know about you, but I'm keenly interested in trying to understand what happened in that 10 years. What happened to a group of people so that they started to change how they thought? They started to change how they acted. What stories did they start to tell each other that convinced them to stop the boot kissing? To stop the groveling and the begging before the king and instead to stand up and to stand up straight and put their shoulders back put their chin up, look directly at the king, you know, the king who claimed cultural authority from God, and behind the king see the most powerful military empire the world had ever assembled to that point of time, and say, you're done, get out, we're going to do it different. Because let me tell you something, folks, the process I just described, that process is magic. And if just one person stands up against injustice and oppression, that's a courageous act that needs to be applauded and acknowledged. And at this point, yeah, you can applaud courageous acts. And in fact, at this point in time, I just want to lift up the name Mr. Wei Lin. That name is not known, and it should be, because Mr. Wei Lin is that Chinese businessman who, armed with nothing but a briefcase, had the courage to stand before an entire column of tanks at Tiananmen Square. Right? That's a courageous act. It needs to be acknowledged. However, that act wasn't magic. Because the real magic I'm describing can only be invoked when one person stands up against injustice and oppression and somebody to her left stands up and somebody to her right stands up and you get this collective standing up together. And that's when magic cackles all around us. And at this point, I just got to say, may the goddess bless the Occupy movement. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Occupy. Occupy was and is magic. It was magic because they weren't just inviting us to occupy public space, as important as that was, they were, Occupy invited us to occupy imagination space, to imagine that we could think and act and live differently. And it doesn't give me any joy to report this truth. It's worth pointing out that the real ruling elite of this country working through the Obama administration, through the Department of Homeland Security, worked with leaders of the Republican and Democratic Party and corporate America and mayors of every major city in this country and designed a plan that they then implemented to go in, disrupt and dismantle every Occupy encampment on this, uh, in this country. And you know why? because they saw that ordinary people were having systemic conversations about how the society works, how politics and economic and culture worked. Occupy was and is magic. And I say it is because I, Move to Amend would never dare to speak for Occupy, but we happily collaborate with Occupy. And I don't know what Occupy 2.0 is going to look like in 2013, but it's gestating right now. 
And when it does move to amend, it's going to collaborate with it. And I'm happy to tell you, if you didn't know it yet, the inter-occupy group of people from across the country have just unanimously called for a national gathering in Kalamazoo, Michigan. <laughs> the Midwest, I think this is genius, right? Not a, Wall Street was an important, important place to occupy, but instead they say, let's go to the people. Let's go to Kalamazoo. Why Kalamazoo? The site of the largest land oil spill in the history of the United States. Who knew that? Like, all right, so it's an astute crowd, but even in this astute crowd, only a hand, a few hands raised. I didn't know it, and like, I'm pretty well involved. So the point is, what they're realizing is, we've got to actually look at economic justice, the ecological catastrophe, war and empire, and start to cohere a, a shared common approach to it. And Move to Amend has been invited by Occupy to bottom line or to hold the entire economic justice space. And we're going to not only be talking about move to amend, I am happy to tell you that the folks at the Public Banking Institute, and I want to just uh, lift up the name Mark Armstrong because Mark has agreed he's going to come with me uh, and they're going to do teach-ins on public banking to occupy, right? We're going to do teach-ins on cooperatives, we're going to do teach-ins on community currency, we're going to do teach-ins on the prison industrial complex so we can start making the connections between economic injustice and racial injustice and how they're inextricably linked. We're going to do teach-ins on uh, strike debt and uh, both, both student debt as well as medical debt as well as consumer debt. We're going to do teach-ins that makes these links. So Occupy 2.0 is on the way and if any of you can get to Kalamazoo in August, come on out, OccupyNationalGathering.org. And if you can't get there, but you know anybody in the Midwest, let's get the word out. Let's make sure that a thousand or more people converge to actually make that happen, right? And back to my story, because remember, we're talking about the American revolutionaries and the American Revolution, the revolutionaries won, yay that, so a new charter gets written. This new charter is going to describe how the political and legal system operates, the supreme law of the land. What's that charter called? The U.S. Constitution. How many of you have read the Constitution? Oh, good. A lot of hands go up. Y'all grade my papers. See if I get this right. I'll tell you when you read the Constitution in its entirety, you'll see two actors. The first actor is the most important actor. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words. We the people. We the people. Those are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. See, we the people come together to create the second actor, which is government itself. Saying it this way, I hope it's clear, we the people create government. Government is dependent upon us. In fact, many of my friends and political colleagues say the people should never be afraid of the government. Instead, they say government should be afraid of the people. How many of y'all believe the government is afraid of the people today? I do. I know they are. Another hand here. It's interesting, young, younger people are raising their hands. And you know what? Let's remember, Occupy. They were afraid. And you know what they were afraid of? Let's remind ourselves. They were afraid that nonviolent revolutionary ethos was actually beginning to be cultivated here. And you know what? I'm not even joking, y'all. I wish that I could have the opportunity to talk to some member of the real ruling elite. You know, the, the, not just the 1%, but the like 0.00083%, you know, the people who are really running the show. Because you know what I'd like to tell such a person? Don't be scared. We're a peaceful people. In fact, you're going to like the world that we create. And certainly, even if you're so addicted to, to the crack pipe of power that you can't that you can't enjoy the world that we're going to create, your children and especially your grandchildren are going to be grateful that we did an intervention on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> because these people are addicted to power the same, in the same manner as any crack addict would, right? And they can't even see past that crack pipe of power and they've forgotten what it means to actually be in relationship with other human beings and to be in relationship with the natural world, which is our birthright.
This is actually not just what we want, it's what we deserve. We deserve to be in collaborative, cooperative arrangements with other human beings, and we deserve to be doing that in a sustainable manner where we're not exploiting and oppressing and destroying the natural world that we depend upon for life itself. That's what we deserve. And what I'm telling you is this, as we begin to get better and better at telling this new story, we'll create a new narrative. And the change that we're holding in our hearts will become the reality that we experience. I want to get back to the Constitution because in the U.S. Constitutional Framework, we the people are understood and described to be free and sovereign. What does the word sovereign mean again? The authority to rule. The king isn't sovereign. We kicked his butt out. But check it out, government isn't sovereign either. Government doesn't have the authority to rule over us. In this framework, government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. That's got a ring to it, doesn't it? I like how this is going. Let's continue. We the people are free and sovereign because we the people have rights. Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. And the difference between rights and duties is profound. If I have the right to do something, it means I can do it. And I don't need anybody's permission. I don't need this group's permission. I don't need the city council of Corte Madera's position, permission. I don't need Marin County Board of Supervisors' permission. I don't need the California State Legislature's permission. I don't need U.S. Congress's permission. Man, I'm from Texas. I don't need my mama's permission. <laughs> Legally. Culturally. Because some of y'all in California have heard what we all say in Texas. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. <laughs> and it's a joke, but it's also important because, see, that's a cultural reality, right? And isn't it interesting that in this society, somehow, the, the, the cultural values that we hold around love and compassion and sharing and sustainability, our legal system is completely divorced from that. Our legal political and economic systems are actually facilitating the exact opposite of the values that we hold. That's a problem. And duties are legal responsibilities, right? And how does, so government never has rights over the people. In fact, government can't infringe upon my rights. If government writes a law at the local, state, or federal level that infringes upon my rights or your rights, or Leon, your rights or anybody's rights, government's wrong, not us. It's an illegitimate exercise of governmental power. And government never has rights. Government only has duties. And where do governmental duties come from? Well, remember, folks, all power resides with the people. Thomas Jefferson famously said, no government is legitimate if, it does not, if its powers do not come from the consent of the governed. Right? And so that will now bring me to a pop quiz question. What is the population, more or less, of the city of Corte Madera? 8,000. 8,000, more or less? So I'll tell you this. I will celebrate that 8,000 residents hold all the political power in this city, but I'll tell you this. I don't want to go to a meeting of 8,000 people where we decide, where should stop signs go? And I like political meetings. I'm not going to that one. Can you imagine? Now imagine the county of Marin. How, how big is that? 250,000, a quarter million people. You want to go to that meeting? Now imagine, what are we, 25 million in California, more or less? 38. You want to go to that meeting? The point I'm making is, in our framework of government, the people do hold all the political power, but we wisely delegate a certain amount of our power to government. Do we delegate all our power to government? Hell no, we only delegate enough power for government to perform the duties that we have told them to do. And that, my friends, is what limited government means. Government is limited in its power to perform the duties that we, the people, have told them to do. And how does government discharge those duties or perform those duties? They write laws in the public interest. And at this point, I just want to stop for a moment and say, there's obviously going to be disagreement about what those public laws should be, right? And frankly, that's as it should be. There should be robust discourse and debate on public policy. But I'll tell you this. I feel rather young to play the I remember when game. But I remember when you could have fierce political debate with somebody and still be respectful and civil to them. 
I remember my daddy arguing with Mr. Barry. Mr. Barry was our neighbor, not our next door neighbor because I grew up in the country. But he was our property owner over, right? And as a little kid, I was about seven or eight years old, and Daddy and Mr. Barry were fussing and fighting. And at any moment, I thought, oh, my God, they're going to start hitting each other. And uh, think about that. Don't be sorry for me, but think a moment and feel sorry for that seven or eight little, old, little boy who was watching his daddy and somebody that he had taught to respect were like, were like just yelling and so mad at each other that I was scared and I was on the verge of tears and like I didn't know what to do. And the next thing I knew, Daddy and Mr. Barry were laughing and joking and Daddy says, Bar Barry, you coot, you crazy loon, I'll see you at the game or the feed store or something like that. And as a little kid, I went, what happened? <laughs> what was that? As an adult, I think I know what happened. See, I think that Daddy and Mr. Barry realized I'm in human relation with you. Now, these were redneck white men. They didn't talk like this, but that's, that's not the words they used. But this is what was happening was my kids play with your kids. Your kids play with my kids. During hurricanes, we depend on each other. I watch your property when you're not around. You watch my property when I'm not around. See, they realized that that human relationship was more important than whatever they were fussing about. And I wish that I could say with certainty that daddy was the one who broke the ice, but I, I can't. I don't remember it. But what I do remember, the next thing I know, they're like, you know, they're hitting each other. They're not just shaking hands, but they're doing one of these numbers and like, huh, ah, because, you know, it's Texas. They couldn't hug each other, which is clearly what they wanted to do. <laughs> but that cultural story was so intent upon not letting men actually be the loving creatures that we can be, which is kind of sad. So as a Texan, I got to say, I ain't, I ain't joking. I'm happy to be in Northern California where I can hug another man whenever it feels like it's the right thing to do. So see how cultural stories can change? It can happen, right? We see cultural stories can change before our very eyes. But I also want to remind you folks, we've already covered this. One thing as the government is discharging their duties they cannot do is to write a public law that violates the private rights or the constitutional rights of anybody. And now that we've spent this time laying out this framework, in, watch this. In one sentence, I'm going to describe how our Constitution is supposed to operate. It's a run-on sentence, but it's still one sentence. Watch this. In the United States constitutional framework, we the people are free and sovereign because we hold all the political power in this country. But we wisely delegate a certain amount of our power to government, government which we will always hold subordinate and accountable to we the people, and we will charge government with the specific duties to write laws in the public interest. And those laws at the local, state, and federal level are actually how public policy will operate. However, the one thing that no public law can ever legitimately do is to violate the private rights of the free and sovereign people who live there. Ta-da! I mean, really, isn't this brilliant? Isn't this beautiful? We should try that in this country. This would totally work. And I'm not joking, this is brilliant. I'm not joking, this is beautiful. And I'm also not joking, we've never tried it. Because before I go one second further waxing poetic about the brilliance and beauty of the US Constitution, I gotta get a quick time out to ask somebody tell me in what year is this document implemented and becomes the supreme law of the land. Nicely done, 1789 is actually the ratification date of the US Constitution. And now that we know that legal personhood means the ability to assert rights under the legal system. Who gets to be a part of we the people that can assert rights? What are their characteristics? They're rich. They've got to be rich landowners. You've got to be white. Oh, thank you, ladies. You've got to be a man. If you're not a man, you're not a per you're, you can't be a legal person. If you're not rich, you can't be a person. If you're not white, you're not being a person. Anybody know what percentage of the adult human beings living in this newly created United States actually could claim legal personhood? What percentage? 11 percent? Six. Six? Nobody is sufficiently cynical. It's five percent. <laughs> Another way to say it, 95% of the adult human beings were not legally persons. Another way to say it, as beautiful as this document was and is, the problem wasn't in the document itself. The problem was in the definition of who is a person. Remember, it matters. Legal personhood matters. I like how Howard Zinn said it. May the goddess rest his soul. Yes, yes. Howard Zinn said, 
If you want to know the whole history of the United States, he didn't say this, I'll say this. If you want to know the whole history of the United States, read the book, People's History of the United States, written by Howard Zinn. But Howard Zinn said, here's one sentence. A series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as persons with rights under our Constitution. See how important that is? A series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as legal persons. That's our history. And now that we've lined up this incredible framework, it might behoove us to ask, where should a corporation go? Well, as we do that, before I put it up there, I want to ask, somebody tell me what it takes to form a corporation in California today. $200 and an application. And as long as you filed your application correctly and your check clears, guess what the Secretary of State will issue? A charter. How long can your corporate charter last? Forever. What can you do with a corporate charter? Under California law, the code says anything legally permissible. Apparently, if you have enough money and power, you can do totally illegal things and get away with it. But the point I'm making is we don't even think about the corporate charter today. We don't think about this institution that is prolific, that is the most dominant institution, right? Now I'm going to take you back to 1789 and tell you what it once took to form a corporation, not only in Massachusetts, but in every state. And this was true for the next 75 to 100 years. First, your application doesn't go to a trivial clerk. Your application goes to the State House of Representatives where they discuss, debate, and vote on it, and you've got to get a majority vote. And even if you get that majority vote, that's not good enough because now your application goes to the State Senate where they discuss, debate, and vote on it, and you've got to get a majority vote. And even if you get two majority votes from those two bodies, it's still not good enough because now your application goes to the governor who considers it and has to be willing to sign it. Does that sound anything like a corporate charter today? Of course not. What did I just describe? A, a law. A law. This is the legislative process. The point I'm making is limited liability incorporation was once considered such an incredible privilege that it was the functional political equivalent <laughs> of legislation. And if you were granted a corporate charter, it didn't last forever. It was restricted to 5, 10, or 20 years, at which point it automatically dissolved. And if you wanted to continue limited liability, you had to reapply. Oh, and by the way, if you were granted the privilege of incorporation, it was very limited in what you could do with it. And if you did anything else other than the specific thing you applied to do, guess what happened to your corporate charter? Okay. Revoked. Corporate charters were routinely revoked for going ultra virus or beyond the authority of why they had been allowed to exist. And check this out. Even if you were in the limited time period for which your corporate charter had been granted, even if you were doing the limited thing that you had been allowed to come into existence to do, if you ever did anything to violate the public trust, guess what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. Corporate charters were routinely revoked for merely acting outside the public interest. Which brings me to this pop quiz question. Somebody name a single one of the Fortune 500 corporations that could even exist today. I'll wait. <laughs> None. You know it. I know it. We all know it. If there was once the same level of political control that the founder's original intent, for those folks who claim that they're concerned about the founder's original intent, if we had the same political control, we wouldn't even allow these huge transnational corporations to operate. Now, obviously, most corporations don't, could still operate. I'm not saying that corporations couldn't exist. I'm saying the rapacious, destructive, exploitive, oppressive ones would not be allowed to operate. And what I'm also saying is this. 1789 was not the land of milk and honey, right? Slavery existed, the patriarchy was real, there was all sorts of economic exploitation. But the tool known as the corporation was appropriately controlled under the political process and under the legal system and the Constitution. And now that we understand that it takes an action of state government to create that corporate charter, we understand that the corporate charter can be used to hold the corporation subordinate and accountable. We understand that the corporate charter describes the duties of what a corporation can or cannot do. And we understand that a corporation should only be allowed to exist if it serves the public interest. Isn't it obvious that a corporation must go here so that it can be under the proper political control? And now, my friends, thank you for your patience, because here comes the punchline. When the US Supreme Court, in an act of supreme judicial activism, by the way, 
says we're going to tell you actually five of us are going to tell 315 million of you that notwithstanding history notwithstanding logic notwithstanding prior understanding of how this whole political economic and legal system is supposed to operate you must now treat a corporation as if it's a person with inherent and alienable constitutional rights and that perverts this whole framework see corporate personhood is a shorthand for the idea that a corporation can claim to have the inherent and alienable rights of a living breathing human beings and that's not just an illogical idea which it is it's not just a stupid idea which it is the idea of corporate personhood perverts our sacred right to self-government and what pisses me off as a lawyer they're using our legal system to legitimize the theft and they're telling us that it's just the rule of law you have to uh, accept it well I say ya basta enough already it's time for us to do what other people have done before us and to educate to agitate to build a mass movement that says we're going to change this country we're going to change the story we're going to change how our political economic and legal systems operate and as i come to the very end of this story i want to remind you of the beginning i asked you to challenge yourself to challenge me is this a story that only political liberals could hear and understand? Or is this one, and move to amend, a process that could cut across ideologies? And to answer the question, I'll tell you this. I've given this story to many an Occupy group, and guess what? I get laughs and I get applause. And I've given this story to Tea Party groups. And guess what? I got laughs and I got applause. Now, I will admit the laughs and applause comes at totally different places. <laughs> but it still comes. And I think it's important for us to lift up. When I wrote limited government on the board and described how that is supposed to work in our system, nobody here cheered. I mean, nobody booed either, right? But guess what the Tea Party did? Yeah. yeah. Sovereignty. See, there's a lot of ways to talk about this. And I'm going to just conclude with this. I will admit that I tell the same basic story to any group, but I do put a different seasoning on it, right? Like, if it's the same meal, but some folks get a different season, right? And so what I'm asking you to consider is this. I'm going to ask you to think about trying to start talking about move to amend and corporate constitutional rights and think about who you're talking to. And depending on who you're talking to, I suggest to you that you can find so much common ground well over 80% of the American people already agree with us at Move to Amend. Our job is to actually help to create a concrete campaign that can actually amend the United States Constitution. And it's starting to happen. And I want to thank again the Democracy for America, Progressive Democrats of America, the Move to Amend Coalition, and... And so, who else? 10th AD. And 10th AD for bringing us together here. And thank you so much. Peace.